First of all, it's amazing to see this hall full with so many people. It's really my distinct honor and privilege to welcome you all to this historic event. Today we break 64 years of silence about Jewish refugees in these halls of the United Nations. I know that this organization is not exactly a hub of bureaucratic efficiency, but make no mistake, even by UN standards, 64 years is a very long time. By telling the untold story of 850,000 Jewish refugees from Arab countries, we take an important step together on the road to securing truth and justice for them. I'm joined by a very, very distinguished group of power presenters today. First and foremost, I'm proud to share the stage with my co-host, my friend, His Excellency, Mr. Daniel Yalon, Israel's Deputy Foreign Minister, and the Jewish state's great champion of this issue on the global stage. I want to take this opportunity. I want to take this opportunity to thank the two organizations that are co-sponsoring this event, the World Jewish Congress and the Conference of Presidents of major American Jewish organizations. Representing these organizations on today's panel will be Ambassador Ronald Lauder of the World Jewish Congress and Mr. Malcolm Online of the Conference of Presidents. As two of the hardest working ambassadors of the Jewish people, these men have racked up more than their fair share of accomplishments. I'm very proud that we have the Honorable Irvin Kotler and Professor Alan Dershowitz to discuss the legal aspects of this issue. Their brilliant legal minds will shed new light on this gross miscarriage of justice. Finally, we will hear firsthand about the destruction of these ancient Jewish communities from the people who lived through it. Rabbi Ali Abadi, Ali Abadi Mr. Edwin Shuker, and Mr. Shalom Yerushalmi will tell us their family's personal stories of expulsion from Arab countries. Before we begin, I want to let you know in a little diplomatic secret. Some Arab countries were not so happy that we were hosting this conference. They launched a full court press to try and stop it. The response was telling. These countries devoted the same energy to dealing with their role in this painful history, we would be a lot further along on the road to peace and reconciliation. Today we make it clear, very clear, that these 850,000 stories cannot be silenced any longer. I thank each and every one of you for joining us in these halls to stand up for these refugees and their personal history. I'm confident that the words spoken here today from this stage will echo well beyond the United Nations, moving the world one step closer to truth and justice. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that today's event is about the past, but more importantly, it is about the future. Because our purpose is clear here. It is plain and simple justice for nearly one million Jewish refugees whose stories have been hidden, untold, whose history has been left untold. Every year, the United Nations hosts the World Refugee Day. Events take place in all corners of the world. Millions participate. Celebrities flood the airwaves, raising awareness about refugees' populations. They speak about Africans, Asians, South Americans, Europeans, and of course, Palestinians. One group has never made the cut, the Jews who were torn from their homes in Arab countries. Today we say with one voice, the international community can no longer ignore these 850,000 people. Their history is not le no less real. Their stories are not less painful. And the time has come to make absolutely clear why these Jews from Arab countries were forced to leave their homes. This was not an accident. Arab leaders launched a war of terror, incitement, and expulsion to disseminate the history of their Jewish communities. The effort was systematic, it was deliberate, and it was planned. 
Less than two years after the hours of the of Nazi atrocities, in the very halls here that were built to prevent another Holocaust, Arab leaders explicitly threatened the massacre of the Jewish communities. On November 14, 1947, just 15 days before the UN voted to the petition of British Mandate Palestine, an Arab representative stood in these hall of the United Nations and said, and I quote, the petition of Palestine might create an anti-Semitism even more difficult to root out than the anti-Semitism which the Allies were trying to eradicate in Germany. And he threatened, and I quote, if the United Nations decides to petition Palestine, it might be responsible for the massacre of a large number of Jews. In the days leading to up to petition, the halls of the United Nations were filled with these implicit and explicit threats of violence from Arab delegates. Arab countries felt very comfortable telling the world exactly how they would treat the Jewish communities if the ancient Jewish homeland was reestablished in Israel. And then the world stood idle as Arab leaders followed through with these threats of violence. As you heard from Edwin and from Ellie, anti-Jewish violence erupted across the Middle East. Bombing started at Jewish institutions, mobs destroying synagogue and Jewish cemeteries, state-sponsored programs killed thousands. Yet some Arab delegates still have the audacity, the audacity to stand in these halls and speak about the supposed harmony that existed between Jews and Muslims in their countries. This is the idea of harmony. 1947, the Arab League instructed its members to freeze Jewish assets and declare Jews as enemies of the state. New draconian laws prevented Jews from public worship and forced them to carry Jewish identity cards. Billions of dollars of their property and assets were seized. Think about this, the total area of land confiscated from Jews in Arab countries amounts to nearly 40,000 square miles. This is five times the size of Israel. For 64 years, the history has been distorted and whitewashed in the United Nations. Arab countries have never been held accountable for their actions. The UN has never, ever recognized their responsibility for creating 850,000 refugees. The pages that the UN has written about the Palestinian refugees could fill up football stadiums. Yet not a single syllable about the Jewish refugees expelled from Arab countries can be found in any, and listen to this, any of the 1,088 UN resolutions on the Middle East or the 172 UN resolutions dedicated to Palestinian refugees. The Palestinian refugees have, have their own UN agency their own information program, their own department within the United Nations. Of course, none exists for the Jewish refugees. Since 1947, the United Nations and its agencies have spent, like Professor Dershowitz said, tens of billions of dollars, and counting, by the way, on Palestinian refugees, not a cent on the Jewish refugees. It's time for the UN to recognize that this double standard is a troubled standard. It is time for the UN to recognize that 64 years of lip service to objectivity has been a huge disservice to justice. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very proud to come from a nation that immediately embraced some 600 of these Jewish refugees with full citizenship rights they nearly doubled Israel's population at that time. Most Jewish refugees entered the land of milk and honey without milk, without honey, and without money. <laughs> Our country was still at its infancy. We were a developing nation with few resources and huge, huge challenges. Our tiny state budget 
strain to feed them, to house them, and to integrate them into Israel's society. Yet we came together. We came together as one people, a small nation of immigrants with a big vision of what we could accomplish together. As these refugees from Arab countries rose to the highest levels of society, they lifted the state of Israel to new heights. They became some of our greatest statesmen, our leading doctors, lawyers, and especially the Iraqis accountants. Our most million brilliant minds in arts, in science, and in commerce. The remarkable contributions to Israel reflect the rich culture and vibrant communities that they have left behind. Today, my mind is filled with images of the great Jewish institutions that once dotted the landscape of the Arab world. Today, I think of the 2,000-year-old Jobar Synagogue near Damascus, built on the site where the prophet Elia concealed himself to avoid persecution. I think of the Jewish cemetery in Basra, where the great minds that devised the Babylonian Talmud now rest. I think of the Jewish quarter in Beirut, where Jewish businesses, synagogues, and homes once teemed with life. The members of these communities preserve the treasures of antiquity into modernity. They produce some of the holiest books in Judaism. They enrich the Arab communities where they lived with art, with culture, and commerce for generation after generation. Little by little, one by one, these ancient Jewish communities of Arab countries are disappearing. The hands of time threaten to dim their memory forever. Yet there is still time, there is still time for us to speak with truth, to bring the history of these refugees to the world's attention. Today I look across this stage to everyone in this room and out in this crowd and see many who lived through this painful history. I see their children and their grandchildren. I see many whose happy childhoods came to an abrupt end at the hands of a mob, whose family businesses were stolen in the span of a moment, whose lives were changed forever just and just because of their faith. Yet all of you managed to rebuild, you managed to endure, and you managed to succeed with your courage, with your brain power, and especially with your willpower. On behalf of the Jewish state, I extend a promise to each and every one of you. Your journey from the river banks of Baghdad and the hills of Damascus to these halls of the United Nations will not be forgotten. Your history will not be lost and your plight will not be ignored anymore. Ladies and gentlemen, as the outset, at the outset I said that today is about the future, not just about the past. I believe with all my heart that the road to peace will be much more clear with a cloud of distorted history lifted from our path. A peace between Israel and its neighbors must be based on honesty, candor, and respect for, that, for the truth. And this morning, I call on Arab leaders to take up their moral responsibility for the historical injustice that they inflicted on 850,000 Jews. Authentic and meaningful reconciliation will only come with a well of truth to water the seeds of peace. A peaceful future must be built on a truthful past. And it is high time for meaningful, truthfully, and a comprehensive education on this issue throughout the Arab world to begin changing the hearts and minds. And the United Nations, we're here in the United Nations, also has a clear duty to breathe life into its founding ideals by taking responsibility for the historical wrong. It must take the first step in the right direction. I call and I hope to open the doors of these institutions 
to Jewish refugees. Listen to the first-hand accounts. Collect the evidence to preserve their history. Like Professor Dershowitz said, we are not afraid of history, and we are not afraid of the truth. Today, from this podium, I call on the UN to establish a center of documentation and research to document the 850,000 untold stories of Jewish refugees from Arab countries. These refugees deserve the truth, they deserve recognition, and they deserve justice. The Jewish refugees have been waiting for six decades for plain and simple justice. They cannot wait any longer, and neither can you or the State of Israel. Thank you very, very much.